Hi everyone, I'm Ava and I'm an American living in the Netherlands. And today I wanted to talk to you about some interesting aspects about the Dutch language. Now, some of you may have heard me mention this in previous videos of mine, and most of you have likely not seen all of my videos and therefore don't know this. Just kidding. So uh, some of you may have heard me mention this in previous videos, but I am a linguist by training. What that means is I have a PhD in linguistics. You could also be a different type of linguist. So you could be the kind of linguist that speaks a lot of languages and um, translates different type. I am the very nerdy type and um, arguably the more useless type where um, my PhD was in how humans acquire language. But the kind of training you get as a linguist is one that is very broad. So basically you're just very attuned to the different structures of language. Now, believe you me, in the last few years that I've been learning Dutch, and I am still very much learning Dutch, by the way, I have been really attentive to the various aspects of the Dutch language, as linguists do. We are extremely annoying, and it is very difficult to turn that linguist knob off, even though no one asks you to turn it on, but it's always there, and you're always paying attention. But that said, it's actually quite interesting to look at a language from that perspective because you kind of see it differently than as opposed to just at the surface. And I wanted to share some of those insights with you that I have noticed as a linguist. And I should put this very big disclaimer here that the things I'm going to talk about are actually quite basic and broad, so they have not been noted by me, but by other linguists, and I inevitably have come across them in my linguistic training. So this is not Ava telling you about the facts. This is Ava telling you about what other people have noticed, and of course, adding my own interpretation and observation to it. So um, as we like to say that, thank you for all the linguists for doing the work and all errors are my own. Now, the first thing I wanted to mention in terms of interesting things about the Dutch language is a particular Dutch sound. No, not the one that you're thinking of. Well, if I'm guessing correctly, in most cases, you're probably thinking of the sound. <sighs> hey, that actually didn't come out so bad. It was quite phlegmy, nice and phlegmy. Uh, but no, it is not that sound. This sound is actually quite common across world's languages. You'll hear it in different languages, different language families. For instance, a really common word in Spanish is watch, el reloj. And I was taught immediately to, you know, add that phlegm. So it also exists in Spanish. And Spanish is not a language that people typically associate with this sound. But this segment is not about that sound. It is about a vowel. And I'm curious to hear if you could guess it. That vowel is a, and I'm probably saying it wrong because it's actually really difficult for an English speaker to quite get it right. Now, this sound is uh, typically orthographically written as a U and an I together. Linguists would write that sound a little bit differently following the International Phonetic Alphabet, but we will talk about the linguistics of this in just a moment. So this sound is typically heard in words like a, so that's onion, or house, house in English, or trou, like sweater. So it's a really common sound. And as a non-native Dutch speaker, I have so much trouble with it because it is so easy to revert to the ow sound, the kind of sound that you make in English when you know someone like pricks you or you get hurt. Ow, not the same. Dutch people distinguish between ow and ow to the point where my girlfriend or other people misunderstand me sometimes because I can't quite get the ow correct. Uh, even though I try, I think it's uh, coming close with practice, but it's just, it feels weird every time I do it. I feel like I'm doing something strange with my face. Uh, and honestly, it feels more uncomfortable to me than the which I'm just used to at this point. Anyway, so linguistically speaking, this I sound is comprised of two vowels. It is known as a diphthong. The fact that it is a diphthong is not uncommon. Basically, very many languages have diphthongs of some kind. It is also not uncommon to have the separate vowels that are part of this a uh, diphthong in other languages. It's really about the combination of these two sounds. So if you are a native Dutch speaker, you have this very rare sound in your language. Isn't that great? And if you are learning Dutch, good luck with that. You thought you were gonna have a hard time with all the ha 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 ha. Oh no, here is another sound for you. Now, the second thing I wanted to share with you about the Dutch language is the Dutch sentence structure. 
Now I'm not going to be able to cover <laughs> all of Dutch syntax. I can't even stop laughing while saying this uh, in a two minute segment in this video because Dutch syntax is a very rich topic. But I do want to share some of the things I personally, Ava, find interesting about Dutch. And there are also some actually interesting phenomena in there. So um, let's get to it. If you are a non-native speaker of Dutch and you are taking a Dutch class, one of the first things they will tell you is that the verb needs to go in the second place in main clauses. They may even leave out the main clause part and tell you about it later. But what that means is in English, for instance, when you might say yesterday I went to the store, where the verb went appears in third place superficially. In Dutch, you would say gister ging ik naar de winkel. So ging would be in second place. Uh, saying gister ik ging naar de winkel is wrong. It's very Englishy. It's completely out. And in sentences uh, where you don't have yesterday, for instance, you would just say ik ging naar de winkel. I went to the store. See what I mean? Verb is always in the second place. This phenomenon is known as B2, verb second. But that is not where it stops in Dutch. So in main clauses, the verb is in second place. But what about the rest of the sentence? Well, in subordinate clauses, the verb goes at the end. So basically, Dutch follows overall, besides the part that the verb needs to come in the second place, it follows a SOV order, so a subject object verb order. The verb goes at the end. In English, we have a SVO order. So the verb is in the middle and the object goes at the end. That's subject, verb, object. So you can already see that if you are trying to learn Dutch as an English speaker, you might get tripped up on that. And it definitely took me some time to get adjusted because I mean, sometimes Dutch folks will say a really long sentence and then I'm kind of waiting for the point, which you kind of get with the verbs sometimes. So you're like waiting, waiting. You're like waiting in anticipation for them to get to the word. It's all at the end, oh no. Um, and then eventually they'll say the verb. Okay, so the whole V2 combined with the SOV part, that's not that interesting. I mean, it is interesting, but it's not that uncommon or different. What is actually interesting about Dutch is what happens when the verbs are all clustered together at the end of a phrase or sentence. Let's take this Dutch phrase as an example. So the brief die ik heb gekregen in English, the letter that I received, this phrase can also be said in a different way. And that is when you flip the verbs at the end. So you can also say the brief die ik gekregen heb. And both word orders seem to be accepted by Dutch speakers. Now you may have a preference for one or the other. That's great. But I learned German before I learned Dutch. And I was told that in German, you would only have one word order there that was possible, which would be the, the brief die ik heb. No, that was the Dutch one. The brief die ik gekregen heb. So that would be the acceptable one in German. The other way would be unacceptable to German speakers. But why does Dutch allow both? And which one should I use? This is really interesting. And I had no idea that you could just do that, but apparently you can. And also you can have three verbs at the end and then you get even more combinations. So this is kind of interesting. So now that we've talked about sentences, I want to talk a little bit about words and specifically prefixes in Dutch. Now prefixes are interesting in all languages and they are also interesting in Dutch. And I wanted to share some of my favorite things about Dutch prefixes. So in Dutch, when you have a verb and you put something before the verb, the meaning of that verb can change and not always in a way that makes sense or is predictable. To illustrate my point, I'm going to give you two examples. Let's take the word hala. Hala can mean to take or to get. And okay, that's a verb. When you learn another language, you need to learn new vocabulary. A-okay. But the thing that gets tricky about Dutch verbs is that you kind of get a lot of related meanings or sometimes unrelated meanings by tagging on prefixes to the verb. So hala, which is to get or to take, has a different meaning when you add af to it. So af hala is to take away. It's a different meaning, but it's one that makes sense, right? Af is like to go away or to complete or something like that. And then af hala is to take away. This is the point where I think to myself, oh my God, that's great. I love it. I get all of these bonus vocabulary words, these verbs with different meanings by just adding prefixes to them. And once you kind of figure out what a prefix could mean, you just get to know what the meaning of the verb is, right? Wrong, not always. For instance, herhalle is to repeat. Now, I would not get that from hala being get or take. That one does not make sense. 
That one I do not love, but you need to learn it. And that is actually the interesting part about languages is that sometimes they can be unpredictable. Overall, they have all of these rules that you can follow, but they are exceptions to, well, I would say every rule, but never say every rule because they could be exceptions to that rule. See what I mean? Another example that I like is spreke. Spreke means to speak. And then you add to to it. So to spreke is to speak to someone, to address someone or to address a crowd. Okay. That also makes sense. Two is two. Aha. So speak to love it again. I'm thinking new words by just adding the prefix to the verb. And if you know what the prefix means, aha combination. Perfect. Oh no, because afspreke means to agree or to meet up with someone. How again, I'm not going to get that from speak. Maybe when I meet up with someone speaking happens, but if you follow that kind of logic, you could end up with a whole bunch of meanings. So no, that one afspreke is unpredictable and the meaning is not directly derivable from spreke. And the list goes on and on. Honestly, I gave two examples, but you could look this up. And when you start thinking about it, you could just come up with, I would say 50, 60, just very many verbs because there are also a number of prefixes that can be attached to these verbs. And finally, the last thing I want to talk to you about today is something that a lot of people worldwide and also a lot of Dutch people have opinions about when it comes to the Dutch language. And that has to do with dialects. The topic of dialects and languages is actually quite interesting and complicated because as a linguist, you realize that drawing the line between what counts as a language and what counts as a dialect is more difficult than it initially seems. So if you think about how do you distinguish between what a language and a dialect is, you may come up with various definitions. Like maybe it is a dialect when the two varieties spoken are mutually intelligible. Um, in India and Pakistan, uh, Pakistan, they speak Urdu in India, they speak Hindi. Those languages are basically the same with the exception of a few high level vocabulary items. Like I understand Urdu perfectly because I speak Hindi to illustrate the point that the distinction between a language and a dialect is arbitrary. There is a famous saying that linguists like to repeat over and over ad nauseum. And that is that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. This quote was popularized by Max Weinreich, and I think he got it from someone in the audience in one of his lectures. That's what they say. But basically this quote is important because it shows that it can kind of be a political decision about what dialect gets to be called a language. Now that also is related to the situation in the Netherlands. So for instance, in the Netherlands, there is a province called Friesland and in Friesland, they speak Frisian. Now that is interesting because Frisian was a dialect, but it got the status of an official language. So what does that mean? It means that in school in Friesland, the kids are taught Frisian and they get money for it. So you can already see how this plays into the political situation within a country. People commonly like to think of dialects as being varieties of a standard language. So maybe in the Netherlands, if you are Dutch, you have an idea of what standard Dutch sounds like and where people who speak standard Dutch come from. But what gets to be standard Dutch is also quite arbitrary. And what can be arbitrary is not just the distinction between the language and the dialect, but also the distinction between varieties of dialects. Where do you draw the line? Do you say that every person speaks a different dialect? I know this may sound a bit crazy, but it can be very difficult to come up with formal definitions of what should be considered a dialect and how do you distinguish between them? Now, with that said, with that disclaimer, by some definitions of what a dialect could be. So if you're looking at different sentence structures, there have been estimates that they are about 250, a little over 250 dialects in the Netherlands. And if you look at vocabulary or other types of definitions, then you may get a high number of over 600 dialects in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a tiny country. So I've already mentioned Frisian, which is one of the official languages in Netherlands, but there are other dialects and languages that you hear of when you move to the Netherlands. So I immediately learned that in Limburg, they have a variety of dialects and those are the really, those are really famous and popular. Um, even if you're coming from outside the Netherlands, they're some of the ones that you hear of first. And of course I heard about the distinction between the Amsterdam dialect and the Rotterdam dialect. But what is really, really striking is that the Netherlands is so small that you could go, let's say I live in Utrecht. I could go 20 minutes outside of Utrecht, maybe even by bicycle, but no, let's say by train or by car, I could drive out 20 minutes by ordering a cab because I don't drive, but, and then I would come across a different dialect. And on that note, thank you all for watching. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing because that's a really easy and free way to help me out and support this channel. 
And of course, until next time. <laughs>